Hello, uh, thank you everyone for uh, joining this talk today. Uh, our subject is Collecting American Studio Craft and the Legacy of Objects USA, presented by r and Company and Design Miami. I'm Weva Carpenter of Design Miami. I'd like to give a big uh, thank you to our illustrious panelists, whom I will introduce now. Uh, we have Evan Snyderman, co-founder of r and Company Gallery in New York. Uh, one of the most ambitious and influential design galleries out there today. We also have Abby Bangzer in New York, the founder and creative director of the Object and Thing Fair. Uh, she is also one of the curators of Objects USA, um, along with Glenn Adamson, James Amatis, and Evan Snyderman. Our third speaker is Megan Roddy, Senior Vice President and Senior International Specialist in Design at Phillips Auction House. She is in LA. Uh, she was notably one of the curators of the exhibition, The Good Making of Good Things, Craft Horizons Magazine, 1941 to 1979, which traveled to multiple museums uh, between 2017 and 2019. Our talk today will begin with an overview of the Objects USA exhibition, followed by a conversation about the market for collectible uh, craft in America, um, how it's evolved over time and which factors have impacted its trajectory. And we will end with a Q&A uh, at the um, end. So please uh, feel free to write your questions into the chat box. Uh, so without further ado, I will turn it over to Evan to um, begin telling us about the wonderful Objects USA exhibition. Thank you so much for that nice introduction. I'm gonna share my screen. Uh, here we go. Can everyone see that? Okay. Welcome everyone and um, thank you. This is a great talk and something that we're very excited to share with everyone. Um, it's uh, a, a subject matter that we have been passionately uh, you know, promoting and, and building interest in for I think the, the entire life of our gallery. Uh, the idea of craft and design coming together. Uh, there's been a, a real synergy in the recent past, I think, where all of these things are starting to, to happen, where the, the fine arts and craft uh, and design are all coming together, converging in, in a, an incredible way that um, makes a lot of sense. And I'm going to give you first a quick uh, overview of Objects USA, um, because it's an exhibition that does take some explaining. Um, the original exhibition, which was organized by a man named Lee Nordness, um, and with the help of the curator, Paul Smith, who was then the, uh, the head curator of the American Craft Museum, which is now the Mad Museum. Um, Lee Nordness was a contemporary art dealer at the time with a gallery on Madison Avenue selling abstract expressionist paintings. Um, together, the two of them organized this very uh, ambitious, which Weva, you mentioned that uh, exhibition uh, with over 300 artists uh, working in traditional fields of craft, but in non-traditional ways. Um, Lee Nordis was, in, was actually building a collection of fine art for the Johnson Wax uh, Corporation and became interested in craft along the way. Uh, and in that, he, he decided that this would be a great opportunity because there was at this time, we're talking, uh, sorry, 1969 was when this original Objects USA exhibition was organized. Um, it's unclear exactly how long it had been in the making, um, but obviously it had taken quite a bit of effort to uh, organize all those artists together. Um, and the Johnson Wax uh, Foundation or company had commissioned him essentially to build this exhibition, um, sponsoring the entire uh, show, producing uh, the exhibition, which was opened first at the, um, um, the Smithsonian in, in DC, uh, which is now the Racine Art Museum. And then it traveled to, um, sorry, not the Racine, um, the name of that museum, but right, sorry. The, uh, the show traveled to 33 museums around the country. Uh, and then it went to Europe and then on to Japan. So one of the most influential shows of the time, clearly. Um, and with our exhibition, uh, we also felt it was important to uh, include 
50 of those original artists and pair them alongside 50 contemporary artists. This was, uh, so 100 artists included in our contemporary version of Objects USA. Um, and really with the intention to, again, show uh, the world how this uh, idea of the handmade object has kind of come full circle. Um, I'm gonna start to show you a few slides. So here you have an image of a work by Luam Malaki, the chair below, which is a contemporary work from 2020. And above, above that, Paul Huddleberg, a work from 1969, which was included, a similar work included in the original exhibition. Um, what we wanted to do was, was uh, we couldn't find, we couldn't show the original works from that exhibition in 1969 because all those works actually were in the end donated to the institutions um, that this exhibition traveled to, primarily the American Craft Museum, um, getting the bulk of those donations and the Racine at the other end, um, which is um, where the Johnson Wax um, Foundation is housed. So. Um, Here's some images of that original exhibition on the left, the installation. And on the right, you have um, Paul Smith uh, on the left, Mr. Wax, um, Samuel Wax, and then uh, Lee Nordis on the right. Um, so this exhibition, uh, you know, was with all of the objects included some of the most famous artists of the time, um, which is also something to really uh, take note of was the, the the number of artists, but also it's interesting to see how many of the artists' careers after this show really um, exploded. And uh, you had from the most famous artists of the time, people like Sheila Hicks, people like Wendell Castle, J.B. Blunk, um, Ron Nagel, uh, Peter Volkis, the well-established artisans shown next to people that um, you'd never heard of. Now here you see in this, a slide of our, our current exhibition. This is the, the show uh, in the gallery now. And we similarly tried to share um, the space equally amongst those who were well-known and those who were not um, to create this sort of idea of, you know, a democratic exhibition plan. And the whole purpose of the show is in the end to break down the hierarchies of the difference between, you know, the famous or the not famous or the, the fine artists or the crafts artists um, so I think that was really one of the great intentions of this exhibition, as well as showing a diversity of, of artisans. So in that original exhibition, they did a really great job of including artists of color, African-American artists, Japanese-American, Chinese-American, Indian-American, even Native American artists, and a fairly equal balance between male and female artists, which at the time was, was fairly unheard of. Um, in our contemporary show, of course, we tried to follow those same parameters. Um, in this slide, you have Serban Ionescu on the left, um, Woody De Afeo with a small uh, vessel on a blue stand on the right, um, Roberto Lugo all the way in the back, self-portrait, and Anders Ruwald, large ceramic sculpture uh, pictured there. Um, we're going to show just a few slides of some highlights from the show. Um, Ka Kwang Hui was in the original exhibition. Uh, this is a work that's in the show from 1966. Um, Kwa Kwang Hui was an artist who was doing sort of pop art in ceramics at the time, not so well known, um, but his work is extraordinary. And unfortunately there's not a, as much of it out there as I would love, but hopefully we'll find more in the future. Um, and we, we like to show in the, in, the, in the exhibition, you'll see if you do get to visit the gallery, um, we paired him next to this artist, Jiha Moon, who's a contemporary artist um, out of Atlanta. And her work was, as you can see in these vessels, very influenced by Roy Lichtenstein. And uh, Ka Kwang Hui actually was the ceramicist who made the, the ceramics for Roy Lichtenstein in the 1960s. So, so throughout the exhibition, there are these great stories um, that, that come out. Um, and it's been really a pleasure to be able to kind of share those stories with people. Um, one of my favorite pieces in the exhibition is, this is a work by Lenore Tawney um, from 1962 uh, called Peruvian Textile. And some of the artists in the exhibition, as uh, you'll see, were you know clearly influenced by earlier movements. This piece has a lot of Bauhaus 
sort of influence. And there were several artists in the show. Um, Maya Gratel, who's a vessel in the exhibition, is clearly influenced by the Bauhaus. Um, but this is also done in an incredible textile. Um, and this piece was on loan from the uh, foundation uh, and is available only for institutions um, to, per to, to purchase. But in general, most of the exhibition, we tried to create works that could be um, made available for sale about 20 or 30% of the show are, are loans. Um, but that was another great part of the show is being able to collaborate with so many different galleries and institutions and families and, um, and artisans directly. Um, this is a work by Liz Collins, a contemporary textile artist, and it's called Frozen Textile, an incredible piece that's designed to be walked around. It floats in the middle of a, a space um, and the colors are incredibly vibrant. Um, you have to really see this piece in person. It's extraordinary. And Liz is some, someone who um, was a professor at RISD for several years, uh, works in New York, Brooklyn artist. Uh, and I think like a lot of the ex artists in the original exhibition and the artists in the contemporary exhibition, uh, they were professors in general. So there's a lot of professors in the original show and in today's show, people who, who clearly have a large influence on students. Um, and I like to think about this almost as if it's, it's bigger than a trend and it's more of a movement. It started in the 60s and it's continuing today. The idea of the handmade object. Um, this is Richard Marcus. Again, another artist that I think most people in the design realm have really never heard of. Um, but Richard Marcus was one of the most influential glassmakers of the 60s. He's still alive today. Um, and in this slide, you see these two works um, are from 1967, 1968. Um, Richard Marcus was given a Fulbright scholarship in 1967 that brought him to Murano, to the island of Murano. And he was the first uh, person allowed inside the Vanini factory and to work on the Vanini floor. Um, and what that did is it opened the doors to the entire world learning the Venetian techniques, which had been kept secret um, for hundreds of years since Roman times. So. Uh, in this slide, you see this, this work on the left, which is essentially a acid pill made in the shape of, you know, uh, in, the, in the design of a flag. And this piece really came to represent a lot of what the exhibition was about, the Objects USA, the idea of celebrating America for something that maybe that was the positive um, thing that happened here, which didn't happen in other cultures, the idea of the, the craft artist working as both the maker and the designer of the object. Um, something maybe we'll talk more about as we go further on. Um, this is an, another work from Richard Marcus, which is extraordinary. This is made with Marini, which are the little tiny um, uh, glass pieces that are made through cane and then reapplied to the surface. It's tiny, it's only about three and a half inches tall, um, which you can't tell in, in this slide, but it's just an extraordinary jewel of a work from 1967. This was in fact, the first work he made at Vanini, um, this particular piece. Another one of my favorites is Art Smith. Um, Art Smith is uh, a jewel, was a jeweler who had a studio in Greenwich Village through the 1940s, 50s, 60s. Um, has had a bit of a, a, a sort of renaissance in the last 10 years, I'd say. Um, people like Mark McDonald have done a terrific job of getting people to know Art Smith's work. Um, he had a big show at the Brooklyn Museum of Art several years ago, um, but I'm, I'm a huge fan of Art Smith's and his work, you know, is, is comparable to any of the great jewelers of the time. Like the, you can see a lot of Calder and Bertoia in his work, yet um, I think the work is still very, very attainable, which is something that people, you know, it's an incredible body of work. I think on the left hand side is this, this beautiful cuff um, and on the right is what's called the Vogue or the half necklace, sorry. I think it's called the Vogue cuff maybe, or the jazz cuff. But a lot of influence from jazz culture, from uh, culture of that time and, and uh, just, just beautiful, beautiful work. Um, and he was really an outspoken proponent of, of um, you know, the African-American artist and, and took beautiful photographs of these gorgeous models wearing his jewelry. Um, Another artist that, uh, contemporary artist, Woody DeFeo, who um, is in the exhibition from Oakland, California, 
Um, I think Woody is someone that uh, is a really important uh, person working in ceramics today. Someone who comes from uh, the area where what, there was a group of artists in San Francisco uh, called the Funk Artists who were working in ceramics, people like Robert Arneson, uh, Richard Shaw, um, Ron Nagel. Uh, Woody is kind of the contemporary coming out of that culture of this, this idea of a sort of uh, almost surrealist pop uh, ceramics. Um, we can, I think Abby, who uh, was the artist, one who brought Woody into the show, might want to say more about um, Woody, uh, but he's a great influential person and a young artist who's doing great things. Sure, absolutely. Thank you, Evan. Um, yeah, Woody's just uh, 30 years old, and I think he's already made a tremendous impact in both um, this exhibition and the contemporary art world from sort of a wider perspective. He um, trained at California College of the Arts. So um, as Evan said, he was picking up on the funk artists that came before him and even some of the street artists like Barry McGee. Um, and I think what's interesting when you look at his work, he's primarily working in ceramics, um, ceramic with glaze, some full room installations, um, but he's being received. He's one of these artists who are sort of between worlds in a way um, where he had a show at Karma in New York in 2019. Jessica Silverman, a contemporary art gallery in San Francisco represents him and consigned this work to the exhibition. Um, so as we think about, I know this, this conversation is, is a sort of market and collecting conversation. This is an example of an artist who's certainly um, blurring those boundaries uh, that we so often create. Yeah, and I think that's really, that's a really important point that uh, many of the artists in this exhibition are exactly in this crossover between these two worlds. And a lot of that comes from um, what's happened over the last 10 years in terms of the market, um, starting really with um, Design Miami and opening the door to the contemporary art collector, um, understanding and being able to see design in a different way. Um, and that, that trend is continuing where these lines are constantly blurring and you have ceramics artists showing in fine art galleries and you have uh, the vice versa. It's all sort of happening now where the, the, those, those traditional boundaries are starting to break down. Um, something that we've all been uh, very much uh, involved in that process, which is exciting to see it really coming to fruition. Ruth Duckworth is another artist who um, has an incredible influence. Um, this work from 1970 is a large scale uh, porcelain wall sculpture. Um, and Ruth, uh, her, this piece is on loan from the foundation. Ruth's now represented by Salon 94, um, I think has an exhibition coming in the future of her work. Um, this piece is from 1970. And again, very similar to the original work in that exhibition. Um, so we're thrilled to have Ruth included in this exhibition as well. Uh, another uh, young artist, Katie Stout, who uh, we represent here at Art & Company. This is one of her Fruit Lady sculptures. It's, a, it's again, Katie has taken the idea of design and turned it on its head, uh, making traditional, you know, functional objects, but in very um, non-traditional ways. This Fruit Lady is made out of, entirely out of ceramics. Um, and stands almost six feet tall. Um, and Wendell Castle, who we can't um, give a talk without mentioning, because I do give him a lot of credit in being one of these early people who really made that transition. Um, this work was one of two made uh, in 1967 in fiberglass. Um, one was in the original exhibition. The one in our show is the second one from that series, but Wendell was one of those people who didn't want to follow the rules and was actually the first person who Lee Nordness showed that wasn't a painter. Um, Lee Nordness met Wendell Castle uh, and that's what got him interested in this idea of showing craft alongside his artworks and looking at craft artists who were doing these kind of more abstract expressionist things with, with other medium. Um, J.B. Blunk, another hugely influential artist um, who has gotten a lot of great accolades in recent history and also has made that transition being shown at Blum and Poe and other fine art galleries. 
Um, this work is, is an extraordinary, although it's essentially a stool, it's, it's a really powerful work of sculpture. Um, and uh, I wish you could see the back side of it. it the, the piece is completely a three-dimensional work. Oh, and here, I'll let Abby take over now talking about Blunk. Well, as Evan indicated, Blunk, again, being an artist, he passed away in 2002, but in 2010, Blemen Poe started representing the estate. And so uh, seeing his work in a very different context in a contemporary art gallery has, has sort of changed the trajectory of, of where his work has been collected. And um, in recent years, uh, he's been acquired widely by institutions, LACMA, um, certainly MAD has, has important works um, and this is just I love this installation shot it's showing the range because so often he's really known probably first as a woodworker um, but his training and his work in ceramics are also really important to his practice um, in the 50s he was in Japan and just sort of by chance met Noguchi and um, through some recommendations Noguchi made he actually trained and really apprenticed under master um, ceramicists and and took that um, knowledge back with him um, for where he then worked after building his personal home and studio in Marin in Northern California. But these uh, this is an installation view of a ceramic show um, of Blunk's work just from 2019 at Kate McGarry, um, a very contemporary um, gallery in East London. So again, just sort of showing the different context for his work today. Yeah, and, and another point too, to see that this, this idea of a movement that happened here in the, in the United States, this, this uh, American studio movement is starting to make its way to the rest of the world. It's not something that is uniquely American, but it's something that we, we really, um, I think, are just starting to understand the, the, the importance of it as a movement. Um, and that's what hopefully this exhibition will help bring that, uh, you know, that forward. Yeah, it's the exhibition's just doing an incredible job. And I have to say, I'm privileged to be here at the gallery today and um, just walked past Green River's chair here. And it is just extraordinary, um, the, the sort of scale of it and the materiality. Um, but this is this is um, two artists actually make up Green River Project, Aaron Agila and Ben Bloomstein. And in 2017, they decided to form their practice Green River Project LLC. They both come out of the art world um, and their training is as contemporary artists. Ben for a long time worked for the artist Robert Gober and Aaron worked for Nate Lohman um, and they had their own practices and then decided to make furniture. They really wanted to make functional things. Um, today the practice is furniture and also entire interiors. Um, but so they they don't have the training in in woodworking or metalwork. Um, it's a conceptual practice. They come up with the idea and then execute from there. Um, this chair, you know, Evan and I were chatting. You probably want to wear certain things if sitting on it. But <laughs> it's um it's pretty awesome to see. And um, they have just uh, everything is is handmade. They show the kind of um, joinery, the the nails are visible, all of that, um, yeah. and then they they really are about that idea they're putting forward. Um, I think next. I love that about this chair. It has the it's it's a very it's a large scale chair and it has the shape of sort of almost a traditional Art Deco kind of form, like a, a club chair, but then with this grass seat. And and she mentioned that. The joinery, it's actually just nailed together pieces of plywood. It's very raw. It has that, you know, on purpose, like you meant to, to see that this is the way this is constructed. It's, it's really a wonderful work. These are just some other examples of Green River's work now that they've formed their practice um, where they've kind of crossed over into other contexts. So um, this is actually from the first edition of Object and Thing in May of 2019 at 99 Scott. And they did a whole installation of outdoor furnishings. So I thought it gave you sort of a nice view of, of different types of pieces from them and certainly here working in a range of woods and they they love that sort of 
process of discovery. Oh, here's a piece of black cherry wood. I wanna figure out working with that. Here's a teak and, and exploring it and seeing where the materials lead them. Um, and I think we have one more installation view. This is what they've just done currently with us um, at an exhibition at the home of Gerald Luss in Westchester, New York. And here they actually met with Gerald and um, Gerald's living, he turns 95 in October and we're, he's, he's most famous for designing the interiors of the Time Life building in 1959. So they were kind of referencing post-war um, New York design sensibility and decided to make an all aluminum collection. So typical of Green River, get the idea and then figure it out from there. Um, so we've got this, this round um, piece and the chair, both um, are entirely unique as, as is the chair that's in the R and Company exhibition. One more for me. This is um, Kiva Motnik who um, is a really, uh, Inspiring fiber artist. Um, I hope you do get to see her work here in the show. Um, she actually comes from a fashion background for some time. She was creative director um, at Isaac Mizrahi. Um, and she's also maintained a contemporary art practice with um, the artist Susan Ciencelo. She formed a collective called Run Home where they work collaboratively with groups of other artists to make textile pieces and also to teach um, dye making workshops and other kind of communal quilting activities. Um, so she runs a studio called Thompson Street Studio that's here in Soho. And she also has a home in the Catskills um, she's very, very focused on technique and material. Um, so in this piece, um, as with her quilts, um, she brings together a sort of assemblage of materials that she collects in her travels and stitches together. You could kind of think of, of Japanese boro that way. And then also materials that she dyes. She's just an expert um, natural dyer. Um, so she takes, you know, marigold and sumac and onion skins, avocado pits, natural materials to make her own dyes. Um, in this case, the case they're stretched and then stitched together with kind of invisible seams, um, everything perfectly aligned, and then is in a framed um, uh, birch wooden frame here. So these, these works can function um, freestanding in a space on a wall, or um, I have one install shot next of where we have a work to, um, oh, here's this, it's, look how incredible that is with the light kind of going through it. Right. Um, and this and is another installation view of the of the current exhibition, and you can see when, with with her work, it really does transmit light. It's almost as if it's a window, which I found so fascinating. Yeah, and just like Liz's, you can look all the way around it. Um, but I think Evan's point about the light is is very important and and just magical with her work. And we have yeah. one more installation view of another piece she just made for object and thing where it's in a window too. So you sort of see the light coming through and in some ways operating almost as a, a fabric stained glass. Mm -hmm. I was just going to say one uh, regarding the exhibition design and I do hope that all of you can make it in to see the show if you haven't already. It's going to be up through the end or uh, sorry after Labor Day around September 15th I think the show officially closes, we keep extending it because we keep getting more and more people coming, which is great news. Um, and we really do hope to have maybe a closing event sometime in September where we could actually bring people back together, uh, all of the artists who wanna come and see the exhibition. But one of the, one of the great things I think made me most happy about the exhibition was being able to put pieces together to find a common language or thread throughout um, be it the, the the color or the form or the or the story behind the pieces, there throughout the show, there's a lot of discovery and and uh, such one of my I think favorite exhibitions we've done at the gallery in uh, in the twenty something years we've been doing this. Jump ahead to Doyle Lane. Okay. Megan, do you want to jump in? Yeah. 
Yeah, sure. Thanks so much. Um, and I cannot wait to see this show. Object USA is one of my favorite topics. And uh, any chance I have to evangelize craft to design and contemporary art markets, I'll take it. Um, this is a Doyle Lane piece um, that I actually have coming up for auction uh, next week, June 9th at Phillips. Um, it's the first time that we are offering his work at Phillips. And I actually think it's the first time his work is being offered at a major New York City auction house. His market is interesting because it was largely localized um, in California among um, you know, regional dealers and galleries. And I really have to credit Gerard O'Brien from Reform Gallery for really sort of um, getting his name out there and boosting his profile for, for decades. And um, recently attention has been drawn to him through, um, through more contemporary shows and also uh, your show at R and Company right now, his work is on view. Um, and then also at uh, David Kordansky Gallery, there was an exhibition last summer um, that received quite a lot of press. This is curated by Ricky Swallow. Um, and the, the piece that's coming for auction is actually from this exhibition. Um, and this helped uh, boost the profile. He had a, a great, Lane got an ex, a, a big article in the New York Times, which was excellent for him. Um, and I think the sort of um, recent interest in his work is stemming from this revisiting of craft history and pulling out some of the other narratives that the canon um, hadn't really truly recognized until now. Um, and Lane is uh, a good example of, of an artist whose work was shown in Objects USA, but had sort of languished in the lower registers of the uh, art market until more recently. So we're very excited to yeah. see how that uh, performs next week. Um, and our objective um, at auction, which is really the secondary market, uh, with auction is just another part of the ecosystem of promoting craft. Uh, we're continuing the work that the galleries and, and museums um, and dealers have, have been doing. Uh, and craft is such a big area of the market that's full of opportunity. Um, there's a lot of artists, as Evan was saying, that are ripe for rediscovery. Um, it's a part of the market where women were really able to work. Um, that's something that's interesting to me. And as we mine these new histories, which is happening all over the market and in the museums, um, we're seeing that there was a lot of space uh, for women artists and craft. Um, the price points, uh, <laughs> this is the perfect slide for this note, which is the price points can often be more approachable, not for this particular piece, but, <laughs> um, but we're seeing uh, there's, there's a lot of work that's accessible within craft. There's a wealth of material, um, there's still discoveries being made of you know, who these artists are, um, and the large, large collections of craft that have been amassed for decades um, still have not yet hit the market. So the work is still available. Um, I included a couple of slides of works that are at the top end of the craft market. The Peter Volkus work in the previous slide um, is Black Valerius from 1958. And this is um, what we consider, I think, blue chip uh, American craft. Um, and this is again, it's a, a prolific artist, uh, hundreds of works. Um, this is a, uh, he, he's someone who benefited from extensive exhibitions and publications covering his work. This is a monumental piece, exceptionally rare, um, and it just sold last December for 1.3 million. So this now stands at the top of the market for, for craft, really, um, on the secondary market. So uh, this um, was an exceptional opportunity uh, that we were, we were thrilled to have. Um, and then the next slide, these are two works by Wendell Castle, and I wanted to include these because these actually came from the personal collection of Lee Nordness, who was one of the um, organizers and curators of Crafts, uh, sorry, of Objects USA. And so they're both from 1967, um, and they're both what I would consider um, more blue chip castle. This is, again, at the top end of Craft for a prolific artist who also benefited from extensive exhibitions and publications. So this is what you're looking at is the top end of the craft market, which is very strong. And these are the, this is the body of work that is most desirable for him. Um, and this is in the six figure range. Uh, and then the next slide, this is the final slide for me. This is um, June Schwartz. And I wanted to include this because as we are talking about, you know, sort of mining alternate histories for design and contemporary art, we're looking at different media also. So outside of ceramics and fiber and wood, which have made its way into the different marketplaces, we're looking at things like enamel. And enamel was its own category entirely in Objects USA. Um, and so someone like June Schwartz, who again had sort of a more localized market, um, we were interested in offering her work at Phillips to introduce our, our audience to 
to something of this nature in this in this material. And so introducing craft to our audience, which is made up of interior designers, design collectors, um, institutions, contemporary art collectors, there is an educational component. We do have to provide a fair amount of editorial content, whether it's in the catalog or on the website, just to sort of ease people into the idea of this um, and contextualizing these artists among their contemporary art peers. Um, and so in the case of June Shorts, um, it's an example of a market that we are building. Um, it, it, she's one of many artists that were interested in, uh, in promoting and boosting her profile at auction. Um, this is a work that I think the estimate was two to 3,000 and it sold for $10,000. So I'm just using her as a, as a loose example of, of uh, how you can find interesting work, uh, artists that are ripe for rediscovery to be promoted to larger international audiences. That's great. Thanks, Megan. Yeah, th this is really, uh, I like to think about the fact that uh, there's so much more work to do. It, it, it's like we've only just scratched the surface. Um, even with Objects USA, the show we have up now, we uh, have 50 of the original 300 artists. So there's a long ways to go. And, and it wasn't that we only selected the famous people, we selected people for various reasons. And I think one of the you know, one of the most rewarding parts of that exhibition, which I wanted to just mention was the collaboration between the four curators, because that was really uh, an important aspect of making this show what it was. Having Glenn Adamson obviously involved, Glenn is our powerhouse in the craft world and, and all knowledgeable um, on so many things. And uh, but having his, his point of view, as well as Abby and James Amadis and myself, we brought four different perspectives to the curation of the show, which made it so uh, dynamic. And um, I think important to to think about not being one person's point of view or one idea or, or focusing on what was important in the marketplace or important in the history books. Um, but we've only just started. There's so much more to work to do. Um, I think this is our last slide. So, um, I'll just note that th this slide here, we have the work of uh, Rogan Gregory, who's um, doing incredible work in plaster, uh, the, the hanging work. And then on the, on the wood piece on the bottom is by Dan Loomis Valenza, also still living. Uh, he was a really interesting uh, artist um, working here in the state in, in uh, I think it's New Hampshire. Um, and uh, studied under Wendell Castle, um, became a professor teaching for many, many years. Um, and then on the left is um, Tommy Simpson. This is a wood, painted wood sculpture, which is one of my also highlights of the show, one of my favorites. It looks as if it's a surrealism work of art in three dimensions. It's, it's an extraordinary piece. So um, I think that's, that's it for slides. And I guess we can, uh, get back into questioning uh, questions. Yeah, I, I have a few questions, but I'd also like to uh, invite everyone, if, if you do have questions, please feel free to write them in the chat or the Q&A and um, we can address them uh, as a group. Um, but I wanted to ask everyone uh, to, if you could underscore a point that's sort of come up uh, here in the conversation so far about the kind of hierarchy of the arts and where craft has been at different points from the mid-century to now and how that affects uh, the value that's placed on it and is do we still need craft to be seen as art to reach that value or is that changing at all? I'll start. <laughs> I'll jump in. Uh, craft has sort of uh, it's largely been offered in decorative arts and design auctions uh, for decades and so I think there was this siloing of, of craft um, as various craft media, sort of like a lesser media than, than painting um, and sculpture. And so a lot of work I think has been done within the last 10 years even um, to promote craft artists within design auctions. And then slowly because work, we are seeing it turning up, um, you know, at, at Freeze Masters, at Art Basel, uh, ceramic work, fiber work, uh, things coming into the art, fine art marketplace that sort of hierarchy has broken down a little bit, um, but it helps open open the doors to contemporary art, the contemporary art market, which is where um, the, the money is, <laughs> if I can say that. So it's um, it's been good and we collaborate a lot at Phillips 
with the design department and the contemporary art department deciding what goes into which auction, which uh, where that artist is going to benefit the most from the audience. A lot of people are accustomed to still seeing these pieces in design auctions. So that's where they gravitate towards. Um, but sometimes we feel it's time for those artists to graduate into a contemporary art evening sale, for example. Can you um, say a little bit about the criteria that you use to move it into the next category? Some of the criteria is going to be based on interest from the outside market. So if we know that artist's work has been shown or the artist is now being shown by a contemporary art gallerist that is gonna influence our decision. Um, also, some of it is decided by what the value is on the secondary market. If that artist's record is still languishing in the you know, under 5,000, under $10,000 range, it is likely to be in a design auction. It's above, above that, often it'll be in a contemporary art sale. It's a conversation that's still ongoing. That's definitely not an exact science. It requires a lot of uh, massaging and, you know, continuing conversation um, until we until we get there. I think I mean, a lot you, of it has. To, yeah. No, go ahead. Go ahead. I, I was going to say. I mean, the, the 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 it's a great question, and it's obviously a, a, a difficult question mm -hmm. to answer, but it's something that we do talk about a lot uh, internally. But uh, and I think about a lot, and having seen the craft world from the beginning having grown up in that world myself personally and, and watched it sort of highs and lows and the crashes that occurred, um, you know, leading up to Objects USA, the original show, there was, like we said, less of a hierarchy. Of course, there was, it did exist, but uh, a lot of these um, artists were, were considered artists. They weren't considered potters or ceramicists. They were working in that medium. Um, and over the course of the last 50 years, that has sort of with Objects USA, a lot of those artists proliferated, uh, or the galleries proliferated, selling craft. Um, and artists became more uh, connected to their material or their, their medium versus the, the work itself. And I think that's a trap that, that a lot of artists fall into, particularly in craft medium, where you become known for one thing and then you just continue making that one thing. That was the, to the detriment of that movement and to the detriment of that marketplace. Um, and now I think what we have seen is that as like any good um, you know, marketplace, there's, there's this sort of work that gets edited. There's a, an editing that's starting to occur where people are going through the history and finding the, the people who were maybe uh, breaking those rules that were standing out that and, and reinterpreting their work and representing their work. Um, and it comes down to representation. Uh, maybe it's the, the presentation of the work, um, the story behind the artists themselves, the personality of the artists themselves. All of these factors make up what turns that sort of around. Um, so there's, there's so many parts to the, to the story that it, it is really, um, interesting to see that it it can occur and how it works and and who's behind you know making it happen because it it doesn't happen on its own um, it does take a good deal of effort and time um, to to tell and retell those stories like you said Megan that you have to explain a lot of things to people to why is this piece important you know it's not like you just get it instantly um, yeah. and there isn't a secondary market uh, history to back it up um, so, so we're really at the beginning of something I think that's exciting. We're yeah. just at the start, even though this maybe has been happening for 10 years, let's say, it's really only at the start of where I think this can really go. Yeah. Yeah, I've always, um, I mean, I'm not the only one, I'm sure, but, you know, craft medium and the handmade process sort of, it, it's, a, it's a great channel or vessel, metaphorical vessel for identity in a sense of like really telling a, a personal story. Um, you, you spoke of the original Objects USA exhibition having sort of pretty wide representation of, of men and women, but also uh, different races. Um, and that you tried to do that again with this new show. Do you feel that craft does a better job of representing different identities and um, different voices than other mediums? And is that contributing perhaps to its um, sort of rising interest now? More people being are interested in like seeing more voices and hearing more personal stories. I, I sort of wish that was true. I don't know that it is. I think that in fact, it's the opposite. And a lot of the craft schools have had a very, really hard prop time, you know, bringing people 
uh, of color from different backgrounds into the fold. I mean, it, obviously mm -hmm. in certain cultures, this is a very, you know, craft is a very important part of, right. of culture all over the world. Um, but I think it's, it's something that the universities have to work on a great deal to bring yeah. more, more uh, diversity to their programs and more opportunities to, to people um, outside of, you know, what they've been doing because that, that is certainly not the case in general. Yeah. I guess I'm thinking compared to design schools, which I'm sure are, are much worse. I mean, it's atrocious what's happening with design schools, but hopefully that's changing as well. I will yeah. say that when we, um, the exhibition that I worked on with my co-creators, Elizabeth Esther and Lily Kane on the history of Craft Horizons uh, magazine, when we were studying the, the readership of the magazine and its distribution. There was um, a, a lot of interesting statistics that popped up about um, the coverage being equal among men and women, the coverage of male artists and female artists within craft. There's also a lot of coverage of um, uh, craft uh, artists of color, um, indigenous craft people. It was, it was sort of um, more equity in, in terms of representation in craft than I'd say in art or design at the time. So that was certainly an interesting point for us in our research. Yeah. And are you finding collectors uh, particularly appreciate that about the the material or um, is it more the material itself you know the stories think, behind or the thing and the materiality of it I think it, it might be both now I think as you know as I said we're, we're, we're sort of mining these histories and we're pulling things out new narratives from um, from the canon so I think it's it's something that they're appreciating more now uh, there's still a lot of work to be done a lot of you know educational components to take place still um, but I think the materiality of the work also is appealing. Um, you know, the, the audience has, the audience is always evolving. You know, it's, there's, there's mm -hmm. connoisseurship and there's also um, this, this sort of quotient of, of clients that are from the interior design field. So it's also shopping a look, you know, so this is something that, that we're contending with as well. Yeah. Weva, if I could just add, I think they're in this particular show at R and Company um, with the, the question about diversity we, as we were building these lists, and, and certainly, you know, when, when I participated with Evan and Glenn on the contemporary side, we were looking at really all of these makers as artists. And, you know, Glenn, so the, so the artists are coming from art schools, craft schools, design schools, it, it's all mixed together. Um, and what is sort of the uniting factor is this idea that they make objects. Um, so Glenn uh, wrote a really wonderful essay in the catalog. There's a, a terrific catalog that accompanies the exhibition that Monticelli Press um, published. And it, he really emphasizes these kind of neutral words that come up um, in this show and, and in the original Objects USA show too, to, to kind of refer, we refer to the artists as makers here and, and that idea of objects. Um, so so we, we didn't kind of go back and mine particular craft schools or craft histories, um, you know, and hopefully by looking at, at, for example, Woody's work or others that you're seeing, um, you know, someone who really, he's, he's there making art, it's just he happens to use ceramics. And then you have someone like Roberto Lugo, who uh, from Philadelphia, who I've been a huge, you know, fan of for years, who's using very traditional pottery, you know, techniques, making mugs and vessels, but doing applications on the surfaces, you know, related to street art, culture, hip hop, um, graffiti. And this is, you know, this is also something that is uh, taking that traditional form and turning it into something else. Um, it's really nice to see that this is how, and, 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 and the response to, to Roberto's work has been phenomenal. Um, yet it's still incredibly accessible. And I think that's part of his own personal journey that he wants to retain, which I think is fantastic as well. Yeah. There's a lot of personal stories there. He's also a fun follow on Instagram. If you aren't already yeah. following him. <laughs> Uh, well, maybe we have um, time for one more question. Um, there's not much coming in from the chat that I see. Let me just check one more time. Uh, who are the indigenous artists that you're exhibiting in the show? In the contemporary show, uh, well, to be honest, we have only, there's only, there's no indigenous artists 
in the current exhibition. Um, and that was actually quite a struggle to find. Um, so we have way more work to do on that front. Mm. Well, maybe then uh, one final, final question then is everyone's talked about all the work that has to be done. Um, so if you could, you know, wave a wand, what would you like to see happen for this market in the next five, 10 years? And I'd love to see more of a delineation um, between contemporary art and design uh, in the auction marketplace um, in, in terms of how these artists are represented and handled. And for me, the same would go for uh, in the gallery art of market sphere, these artists being handled by by galleries that aren't really delineating, you know, this is contemporary art, this is design or decorative art. Um, that would be important to me. There's certainly I, more a, a synergy happening with the, you know, there's a lot of, uh, at the moment we have several exhibitions besides our Objects USA exhibition, there's the, um, um, the show that is at the, sorry, what the, um, the show that Glenn, I'm, I'm having a complete Crafting moment. America? <laughs> Crafting America, thank you, uh, at Crystal Bridges, which is an incredible exhibition, including a lot of the same artists um, that are included in Objects USA. Um, and they're also, the, the MAD Museum is currently exhibiting their, their permanent collection, which for the first time in decades, they're showing the work from Objects USA that they acquired at the time. Um, I'd like to see more museums concentrating on craft and, and showing work of this period and collecting work of this period. And I do, I do want to say we have had a, a big uptick in museum uh, acquisitions throughout this exhibition. We've had lots of great institutions acquire work from this show. So that's a really nice thing to see and more participation in that regard. This really was uh, looked at as a museum show, even though it was inside of a commercial gallery. Um, and so that's, that's one thing I'd like to see continue. Yeah, terrific. Uh, I, I agree with both Evan and, and Megan and, and certainly to Megan's point, that's something that I am just um, fully stand behind is, is trying to erase the, these hierarchies as much as possible and really look at the works together as, as art made by artists and, and with equal value and equal judgment um, behind them. So I, I think the work that this show is doing is, is such a great example of looking back into history and, and bringing that forward into a contemporary context too. And, and just, you know, I hope in 50 years when it's revisited again, it's just exploded even, even further. You know, it's something in the, in the original Objects USA, all the, the works were classified by material category. And that's something, you know, that's not happening here. It would be impossible to do today looking at, at contemporary artists and how they move among um, media. Well, wonderful. Um, maybe just one last thing. Evan, what is the artwork that is behind you? Oh, um, this is by <laughs> Gino Marotta. Um, this is an Italian, uh, he's an Italian artist from Rome. This is from 1966. Um, yeah. And actually from the collection of Charles Stendig, who cool. was an incredible uh, person who brought Italian radical design to America in the 1960s. It's a neon sculpture, one of four that was made. It's right mine. <laughs> cool. All right, well, thank Megan, you. Evan, Abby, thank you so much for your time. The work is so gorgeous and uh, we're watching this market uh, sure to keep rising. And thank you everyone for uh, coming to here. Thank you. Thank you guys. Bye. Thanks, Weva. Thanks. Bye. Bye.